you get any ideas while you're gone, we're looking for you back in the fall. God bless you. Let us pray. Lord, as we now open up your word, we ask that you speak to our hearts. May we understand the origins of sin in our lives. But more importantly, may we understand the cure. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, today we live in an interesting time. It's a time of massive self-delusion. And people are actually deluding their own selves by the thinking that it happens in our society. We are under a spell that creates false and irrational ideas about right and wrong, good and evil, fashion, ethics, politics. It is a troubling time. But we find that people have some belief systems. They believe that the end somehow justifies the means. That lying is merely a strategic restatement of the facts. That cheating has somehow become normative and that grace somehow condones what scripture indeed condemns. Paul warned Timothy that in these last days there would be a form of godliness but people would deny that power of that form. It is this godly form that somehow deceives us. It sings loudly but it holds obedience with contempt. It feigns holiness on the Sabbath while it revels in iniquity all week long. It looks good, genuine, even authentic on the outside. But on the inside, it's a moldy tomb filled with decaying dreams and rotting hopes of unkept promises. First Timothy gives us this warning or this encouragement. It says, the Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Clue, we're in latter times. We're living in those times. And people are indeed leaving the faith and falling after demons, unawares. We also find in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy or empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. There is no spiritual Switzerland. We are either for God or against God. We're either listening to Jesus or we're listening to someone else who isn't Jesus. The deception by demonic spirits did not start in these last days, however. It actually started at the very beginning of man's history, so if you turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to look at the first few verses there. I'm just going to call out a few of those verses. It's a very familiar story. This is the story of the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And we recognize that there is another force that is in that garden with Adam and Eve, and that is Lucifer in the form of a serpent. And I want to just look at some of the things that Lucifer said. There are three basic lies that Lucifer gives in Genesis chapter 3. 3 verse 1, he says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Lie number one. In verse 4, you will not surely die. You know, I don't know about you, but most of the people that I've known in history, other than a few I read in the Bible, if they were alive, they have died. Anybody here have no plans on dying? Well, I thought you might well say, yeah, Jesus is going to come soon enough. I won't have to die. But if Jesus does not come in our immediate lifetimes, we will all go that route. And then the third lie is found in verse 4. God knows that when you eat of it, speaking of the fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So Satan declared that they would become like God, possessing greater wisdom and being more capable than they'd ever been before at a higher state of existence. He insinuated that Christ was somehow jealously keeping for himself information and knowledge that would allow them to be exalted and be equal to God himself. This is the same work that Satan is busy doing in our time. He tempts men to distrust God and to distrust his love and wisdom for us. And I find it curious that people 
want to know what God knows, but they don't want to do what God says. We want godly knowledge without godly living. Some of us are using God as, and we, we actually use ourselves as God. We become God impersonators, running our own small universe as if there was no God that we had to give a reckoning to. Now, one of the many critics of religion that I'm sure some of you are familiar with is a gentleman named Bill Maher. And he produced what he calls a documentary called Religious. And it attempts to sell people on the idea that religion is the most dangerous thing facing mankind. Here's his words. He says, religion must die that mankind can live. There are a number of atheists and many people are believing and listening to what they have to say and not what God's word has to say. You see, religion really is not the problem. The real problem is the lack of spiritual discernment and the substitution of human reasoning over heavenly revelation. Human reasoning over heavenly revelation, which leads to fanaticism. And much of the danger and the damage that's been done to the world by religions have been committed by fanatics. Have you ever known an Adventist fanatic? Turn to your left. <laughs> there may be one that slipped through the doors. But we can think about some. Perhaps the most notable and the most embarrassing to the church is what happened in Waco, Texas. We'll talk about that in another sermon. There are fanatics. You see, Satan seeks to create a spirit of irreverent curiosity, a restless, inquisitive desire to penetrate the secrets of divine wisdom and power. And what happens when this happens, we become unconsecrated in our opinions because we think that we are right and everybody else is wrong. We like to massage each other's mental capacity to say, I know more about God's word than you do, and I've thought these things deeper. We want to be so deep that we become obtuse and almost obsolete. You see, the problem with Eve and the problem with us is not so much that she didn't believe what the devil was saying, that she believed everything he said, but she disbelieved what God said. If we held on to what God says in our lives, then what everybody else has to say would be meaningless. The problem with Adam, on the other hand, is that he loved Eve more than he trusted God. And so, while she was deceived, he voluntarily knew exactly what he was doing when he took of the fruit. And here we are today because of it. Adam and Eve did indeed come to know the knowledge of good and evil. But they found that lesson to be bitter, filled with remorse, and filled with guilt. Genesis 3, 7 tells us, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. You see, disobedience from God can only expose the nakedness of our hearts. Disobedience tends to strip us of our dignity, of our innocence, of our hope, of our optimism for tomorrow. So I coined a term that I want you to see, and I call it post-traumatic sin syndrome. It's the insipid loss of self-respect and personal worth that dooms you to a life of disobedience and fatalism for your spiritual future. Sin strips us of our identity, of our worth. We are shamed by what we've done. Some of us will pray for 30 years for forgiveness of an act that happened in our youth, not fully grasping the grace of God to forgive because we are so ashamed of our past. But what happens to people when they get locked into a cycle of sin one sin leads to another sin, and they begin to believe they're fatalistic, that I'm just doomed. And if they believe they're doomed, then there's no reason to try to do any better. Because they say, no matter what my efforts are, I'm still going to lose out. I'm still going to go to hell. So they just keep sinning for the fun of sinning, 
knowing that they can't make it into the kingdom. And that is a lie perpetrated by the devil. He wants you to think that you can never be good enough to serve God, good enough to earn his love. And by the way, you don't have to earn the love of God. It is a free gift. He has given it to us. How could I possibly merit his love? How could I possibly be good enough that a God would love me? I don't have to be good. In fact, he loves me even when I'm bad. Somebody ought to say amen. Because there are three bad folk up in this church. I'm one. I've met the other two. Your, your identity is safe with me. Don't worry. I, I won't disclose that. God loves sinners. He came to die for sinners. That should be great news because, by the way, we qualify because we were born in sin and we were shaped in iniquity. Unable to face God with a clear conscience, we, like Adam and Eve, sometimes cover our nakedness with fig leaves, fig leaves of our own making. So they sow fig leaves together in Genesis 3, 7 to try to cover themselves. There was no Walmart that they could run to. They used whatever they had at their disposal. So they started taking leaves off the tree. These fig leaves of self-righteousness, what are they? Self-righteousness is one of the fig leaves we cover ourselves up with, where we believe that we are more righteous than others, that somehow we don't need to worry about it because we understand how to keep the law. Like my former Sabbath school teacher once told me, he hadn't sinned in six weeks. Another form of a fig leaf is what I call stale worship. Lifeless, spiritless worship. Just going through the motions, covering ourselves with a fig leaf. Worldliness, a fig leaf, to cover the nakedness of our, of our hearts. Materialism. The, the idolatry of stuff, having to have more of it, fig leaves, pride, and intellectualism. You know, intellectualism is, is different than actually being smart. It's actually just really reveling in what you think is smart. Those who, who serve the intellect for intellect's sake. Some people use religion itself as a means of hiding from God. We can be so busy doing church that we don't do Jesus. Or we can act as if God did not even exist. Like Adam and Eve, we think that by covering ourselves with these fig leaves of our own making, somehow God will not be able to uncover who we really are and see beyond us to see our nakedness. God knows us better than we know ourselves. He created us. He watches us. You know, turning out the lights doesn't mean that God can't see. And even thinking evil doesn't mean he doesn't read our, our minds. So why do we play these games with God? Because they don't even work with each other. It's like somebody who's balding, a balding man, who takes the remaining few hairs left at the top of his head and combs them over the top of the balding head. I call that a spiritual comb over. <laughs> what is that comb over all about? It's like people who buy Bibles and then never read them. Fig leaves. Or praying but having no faith. It's a fig leaf. Or living in open rebellion Living in open rebellion, thinking that somehow it is more noble to live in rebellion against God than to live like a hypocrite. That's just a fig leaf. You see, our righteousness, no matter how we try to spell it, is like filthy rags. Now, there's some embarrassing things that happen to people who are naked and who are not properly covered. I'll talk about that covering in a minute. One of those things that happens we find in the church, even among church members, is a love and an addiction for pornography. A recent study was done and they found out that somewhere close to 
of Christian men surveyed across the nation either sometimes or regularly watched pornography online or on their video screens. They also discovered that 25% of ministers in this country are regular users of pornography. That's nakedness. We applaud greed, nakedness. We emulate selfishness, holding on to what we have and being unwilling to share it with others. That's nakedness. We are enthralled by violence, nakedness. Or we bow down to the idols of our own opinions, think that our opinion is far greater than what Revelation says. That's nakedness. Or we keep electing lying politicians. I call that buck naked. Because they lie to us and we keep putting them in office and then expect somehow a different result to come even though they're unchanged. So Christ asks a very important question. In verse 9 he says to Adam as he's strolling to the garden he says where are you? It was clear to, to Christ as he walked through the garden that Adam and Eve weren't in their normal place. You could well imagine that as he came through the Garden of Eden every afternoon, that probably Adam and Eve would, would run to meet him, their creator. But he recognized there was something different. While we run and hide, God is still calling us. I am so grateful to know that you can run, but you can't outrun God. So as a pastoral staff, as parents, we pray for you. We pray for one another. We pray for our children. And as fast as they run, the harder we pray. And you need to understand that if you're going to be lost, you've got to outrun the hounds of heaven. And that ain't an easy run. Because grace is going to continue to track you down and force you to make a choice for yourself that we're going to talk about in just a second. Where are you? Are you in the nightclub? Where are you? In some illicit relationship? Caught up in the pursuit of wealth? Chasing meaninglessness and ease? You know, for many people, they live to come home from work and turn on the television and they vegetate until 11 or 12 o'clock at night and they fall into bed asleep. How do we accomplish anything as a people on behalf of God in front of our television sets all night. In fact, if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves watching television anywhere between 30 and 35 hours a week or more. How many hours a week did you spend reading a book? Any book? Or the Bible? Someone once said the best place to hide stuff from God's people is to put it in a book. Because they may not pick it up to read it. Where are you? We are faced with a community around us that's stuck in poverty and depression. 1.4 million people in Los Angeles County are food insecure, do not know where the next meal is coming from. Have we, as God's people, turned our backs on the poor? Where are you? God asks. Are we still hiding from intimacy with God? And so in answer to that question, in verse 10, Adam says, I heard you were in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Nakedness is always accompanied by fear and hiding when God enters the garden of your life. We run away because we recognize that we're naked. Nakedness and fear. Can you hear him this morning coming through the garden of your life? He's strolling. He's in search of his people. He does not retreat. He does not turn his back at our nakedness. God is not offended at who we really are. It is that person 
that naked man or woman that he came to redeem. Therefore, he's not offended by that. He calls us in our nakedness that he might reverse that nakedness. Where are you? It's not just a question. It's a statement, a statement that we're not in our rightful place. And God is trying to get us back into the place that he wants us to be. We are to be the head and not the tail. Aren't you impressed that the world has picked up our health message so much better than we have? There's so many healthy food products out there and healthy choices. You can go to Del Taco and get a veggie burger. You can go to Burger King and veggie bur get a veggie burger. And we go to those same places. We don't order the veggie burger. We order the, the double Whopper with cheese, bacon, and, and, and a cardiologist that comes along with it. <laughs> Whatever happened to our embrace of our own message? If we fully embrace who we are and what we preach, the world would be at our, at our doorsteps. We are not worried about the future. Somebody ought to say amen to that. Amen. We're not worried because we've read the end of the book. I know how this thing ends. And we win in the end. God's people triumph. Yeah, there's this little thing called the time of trouble. I was at a general conference about 30 years ago. And they were selling at this general conference time of trouble kits. And I mean, they were expensive. You, that you had like a year's worth of water and dried food and all the things you'd need, a radio. And, and, and you could buy these kits and take them home and you'd have them for the time of trouble. And I started remembering, I said, well, didn't Jesus promise that my bread and water would be sure? Didn't he feed Elijah with ravens? And I got to have like an RV behind me. To... Can you imagine escaping radar in your RV? They got satellites. From space, they can read your license plate from outer space. And they're sure going to be looking for the Adventists all going to Cedar Falls. Because <laughs> we know we can park our RV there. Hiding from those who would do us harm. No, that is not the answer. Where are you? We are out of our place. God knows where we belong. He knows when we have strayed from our destiny, when we've sold our birthright, when we've chosen, chosen nakedness unnecessarily. So we find in verse 11, Jesus asked the question that we all must think through. Who told you you were naked? You see, Adam and Eve were created with a, a garment of holiness and light. They didn't need clothes. They were covered in this light of, of righteousness. So how did they know? Because Satan tells the world just how naked we are. He robs us of our self-esteem. He leaves us full of guilt and embarrassment. He strips us of our garment of self-respect. In fact, Satan likes to get you into stuff just so he can turn on the light, throw back the covers, and tell everybody, look what I found. He uses us. Or better said, he abuses us. Only Jesus can rescue us from our nakedness. That's why I love him so. He is the divine rescuer of the naked. He is one who clothes us. And how does this happen? Well, we find in Genesis 3, verse 21. So I can get that for you. Oh, right, here we go. It says, the Lord God made garments of skin and Adam and his wife and clothed them. He began what we now know as the sacrificial system. He slew lambs and took their still bleeding hides and covered Adam and covered Eve. The songwriter said, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God. 
Turn with me, if you can, in your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 3, and beginning with verse 1. I want to read you a short story there, and we're going to wrap up soon. We're doing well. The Holy Spirit is still here. Don't, don't panic. He hadn't left. Zechariah chapter 3, beginning verse 1, said, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? He was speaking about his high priest, and all of us are brands plucked out of the fire. Jesus has been pulling us out of the fires of hell and saving us. But Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And it says in verse 3, Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he said, and he answered and spoke to him and those who stood before him, saying, Take away that filthy garment. Take that filthy garment away from him. Jesus takes our filth and covers our nakedness, and that is the naked truth. That is the good news. You see, I don't have to be naked anymore. I can be free, free of regret, free of remorse, free of shame, free of guilt, free of the dread that I'm going to go to hell. I don't have any of that, and you don't have to have any of that, because Jesus has already taken your guilt, your pain, your suffering, your embarrassment upon himself. Romans 8, chapter 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation. What part of no did we miss? No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And then in Revelation, we have this invitation. I counsel you, buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you become rich, and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. It is the righteous covering the bloody garment of Jesus that covers our nakedness. And we must have this garment to see him in peace. Because all we, like sheep, have gone astray. If our first parents had only trusted God, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in. I hope that one day our children cannot say, if my parents had only trusted God, I wouldn't be in the mess I'm in. It's time to make it right. The naked truth is that we too are living as victims of deceit. We've been deceived by the devil. Satan is still lying and he will still continue to lie to us and people are choosing to believe the lie and to ignore the truth. The story is told about a fire that happened in a, in a community and people started running to the fire and when they got to the house that was on, on fire, there was a little boy who had been inside the home. He woke up and smoke was all around him and he was able to go through the attic and climb up on top of the roof. And the firemen were trying to put out the fire. And his dad stood at the bottom of the, tr of the, of the house and said, Johnny, jump and I'll catch you. And the boy sobbed back and said, but I can't see you. And his father said, but I can see you. And that's all that matters. Ladies and gentlemen, you may not be able to see your way clear, but God sees you. And at the end of the day, that's all that needs to happen. Your Savior sees you. He has not turned away by your nakedness. That's the naked truth. The songwriter said, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking 
to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters lifted me. Now safe and my love lifted me. Love lifted me. God loves me even in my nakedness. He does not leave me naked, but he covers me. Not in my righteousness, but in his righteousness. And that, indeed, is the naked truth. So now the decision is yours. You can choose to remain in nakedness unnecessarily. Or you can choose to be covered by the righteousness of Christ. Bow your heads with me. Every eye close, every head bow. Lord, there, are, there may be a man or woman, boy or girl, right here who has lived in the embarrassment of their spiritual nakedness. They've embarrassed themselves. And people in this room may have no idea what that, what that is in that person's life. But Lord, you see him or her, and that's all that matters. So while we pray, if there is someone here who says, I just don't want to be naked any longer, just, just slip your hand in the air. Say, Lord, cover me. Cover me by your grace. Cover me with your righteousness that my nakedness need not appear. Lord, you've seen these hands. There are men and women making decisions with eternal consequence. We have seen what nakedness can do, but we are so grateful to know what righteousness can do and that you can cover us. So we pray for that covering in the strong and powerful name of our Lord Jesus Christ, let the church say, Amen.